Hello everyone, I'm Susan Nash, AAPG. I'm so thrilled today. This is something very special. Here in Norman, Oklahoma, there is the Sam Noble Museum of Natural History, and there is an amazing special event, Sahara Sea Monsters ex exhibition. <clears throat> and I liked it so much. I've been there like five times now. So I thought, I wonder if the curator would, would um, and, the, and the paleontologist could talk to us. Because what's special about this is not only does it talk about like the, the, the different species, but it really goes into paleoecology and, and the conditions, which are so critical for us to understand in deep time. I mean, they shed light into depositional conditions, potential diagenesis, everything. So I'm just thrilled today to have the opportunity to introduce Elana Register and Isa Aronson. And also, um, please mute. And I'd like to also um, turn this over to Mike Engel Davis, who's the, the um, president of the Energy Minerals Division, who is uh, supporting this and will tell us a little bit about the activities. Thank you, Susan. Uh, like Susan said, my name is Mike Bingle Davis. I'm the current president of the Energy Minerals Division, which is one of the major divisions of the um, AAPG. And we are glad and happy to uh, endorse this presentation. And I thank Susan for putting it together. Uh, so often, you know, we participate in, in discussions of industry and whatnot, and it's great to be able to see things like this. Um, I'm a resident of Casper, Wyoming, so it's extremely rare that we get to see some of these things unless we go down to Denver or travel great distances. So I'm very happy to uh, be able to see this and participate. Uh, the Energy Minerals Division, just to be real quick, not to take up too much time, uh, focuses on some of the things that are most important right now in today's society. Uh, when we're talking about any of the mineral extractions and things like that, some of the transitions that everybody's talking about to newer technologies. So I encourage everyone that's listening or everyone that's on this or listening later to take a look at AAPG and to take a look at the Energy Minerals Division. Uh, it's a lot more than what you would consider to be the traditional oil and gas. And we are looking for participants, people that are active, people that want to see presentations like today, uh, as well as, you know, contribute and add other varying aspects of geology. Um, so take your time, enjoy the presentation and take and look at AAPG and the Energy Minerals Division. And I, I think uh, all of you would, would be welcome to join and help uh, make us a great organization. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Mike. And I want to mention that we are recording this, so it will be available afterwards. I will send a link with the, a, an email with a link to the recording and also to the um, Sahara Sea Monsters um, page. And I have a special request <laughs> that I received. So I just like to say hello, a special greeting to Samuel and Augie um, Cassiano. So hello and welcome. <laughs> and also now I'd like to turn it over to Elena Register and Isa Aronson. And please tell us a little bit about yourself and then let's let's get going. Yep, thank you so much for having us. I'm Alana McGovern Register and um, I am not a paleontologist, but I am uh, an interpretive writer and curator. So um, my job is to take uh, the science and talk to paleontologists and talk to scientists and then interpret that and write it for um, exhibits and and uh, put it forward and present it to something that the general public will be able to understand and appreciate. So, um, and then I work with Isa Aronson, so I'll let him introduce himself. I'm Isa Aronson. I live in Morocco and I've been working with the fossils for around 20 years together with the French paleontologist, and that's how we got all this stuff prepped and out to here. Yeah, I've been working with Isa and his family for a little over 10 years now, and I think it was probably five or six years ago that we finally had the idea to maybe do a joint venture and 
exhibition on the amazing fossil record that can be found in Morocco. So this project took us probably five years to bring to fruition. So we're very excited to have it on display um, at the uh, Sam Noble Oklahoma Museum of Natural History right now. So with that, I will jump right in. Um, we're gonna take you on a fossil tour of Morocco right now, all the way back. We will start, um, let's see, why is it not going? There we are, 600 million years ago. This is what life looked like uh, in Morocco and worldwide 600 million years ago, pretty much. Um, these are stromatolites. So these are um, an interlocking chain of cyanobacteria, photosynthetic cyanobacteria. And if you go back even farther, you have about 3 billion years ago, um, they actually oxygenated the earth. They um, were uh, the byproduct of photosynthesis is oxygen and they created massive amounts of oxygen that then um, pretty much killed everything on the planet because everything alive at that time, um, oxygen was toxic. Um, so they kind of created the very first mass extinction event. And, um, but it's not counted in our big five that we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna talk about the big five extinction events. Um, but this artwork, all the artwork in the exhibit was created by Julius Chutney, who is a um, pretty famous paleo artist. If you've seen any news articles, he's uh, probably the one of the artists that does uh, National Geographic uh, things and uh, the Smithsonian. If you've been to the Smithsonian deep time exhibit, he did a lot of artwork for them. And he's actually a PhD microbiologist. And so he wrote the signage for some of this microbiology things, um, which was really fun to work with him. So here are the Moroccan stromatolites, cyanobacteria stromatolites from 600 million years ago, right before the explosion of life um, in the Cambrian. So here is a chart that I, I kind of built to kind of orient people at the beginning of the exhibit. It talks about, there's so much information on here. Um, it talks about all the different um, extinction events um, placed on the level of bio, um, biodiversity. So, um, and it talks about what caused each one of those um, extinction events. So I'll refer back to this, I'm going through it really quick, but I'll refer back throughout the, throughout the talk today. So here is uh, something that ISA actually does. I think they took these photos on their most recent tour and sent them to me. But in Morocco, you can see this is a map of all the fossil sites in Morocco. And then I guess I can tell you a little bit about what they do. Yeah, we do some of the tour collecting where we go uh, to most of the fossil sites, the trilobite sites and amorites and some of the agates. We also collect minerals and stuff. So it's a two week tour where to do, or go to all the locations in Morocco, all the uh, different locations. Yeah, so we'll refer back to this map as well because each of the different locations has a different um, geologic age and different specimens. So, um, but yeah, if you ever want to go see Morocco yeah. and do a camel tour and see some fossils, let's, we can <laughs> reach out to Isa. <laughs> uh, so the Cambrian is, you know, popularly known as the explosion of life. This is where things go from more of the single celled uh, bacteria up into these hard exoskeletons. And even in some places like Canada, they have soft body preservation of just wild anomalocarids and worms and you know really interesting, crazy, bizarre life in the ocean. But in Morocco, all that we really have so far that has been discovered is the hard exoskeleton creatures that preserved really well. So you have lots of different varieties of trilobites. You have ones that go all the way up to um, a foot long. The, the Akato paradoxides is a foot long trilobite. Um, and then all the way down to microscopic trilobites. Um, and they're all found, uh, as you can see up here, this is the um, High Atlas Mountains. So Marrakesh, this is the end of Marrakesh over here. And then this is the High Atlas Mountains with Algeria kind of not too far away on the side there. So then in the exhibit, we go into the great biodiversification again event, the Ordovician. This is when things 
go crazy. Your speciation just goes nuts. You have, this is a shop in Morocco that has mostly Ordovician trilobites. We call this the mustache trilobite popularly, <laughs> um, but they have these great handlebar mustaches that come off of them. Um, big death assemblages. This is over 50 trilobites all died at one time. Um, maybe a mass mating event or um, some sort of congregation like horseshoe crabs today have large mating events. Um, and then over here, you can see this is stuff that you would recognize today. These are brittle stars, crinoids, um, uh, sea stars. These are all things that actually survive from pretty much this point all the way forward in today's oceans and remain relatively unchanged from their original body plans. Um, so really fascinating to see these and they're preserved beautifully in Morocco. Now this is one of Julius's pieces I call the alien space invasion because it has these just bizarre, crazy creatures. And in Morocco, we have this really special um, fossil preservation at a place called the Fezwada. And so this is the Fezwada um, formation. And they discovered there that there was soft body preservation that is as exquisite as you can find at Burgess Shale or any of the other soft body, it's called a Lagerstatten. And there's only five Lagerstatten localities for the Ordovician in the entire world. So this is like one narrow, narrow window into the life that was alive at the uh, time of the Ordovician. And so we have like over here, this is uh, an anomaly carid uh, that is one of the early filter feeders. And it was like six feet long. This is the mantle um, of an anomaly carid that is just, it's huge. It's really cool. And then you have trilobites here. This is a parade of trilobites and they would have been under the sediments. This one would have actually been blind and it used its little um, feelers to feel through the mud and create a channel in the mud that then the other trilobites would follow along in this channel. And so they would create like one uh, march through the, through the mud. So really, really fascinating stuff. Um, so at the end of the Ordovician, we come to our very first um, major mass extinction event. And so you can see this is why they, this uh, curve right here is why they call it the uh, mass or the bi great biodiversification event is because the number of species and families goes up dramatically in this time until we get to global cooling. And what happens in global cooling is that all of the uh, water uh, gets trapped at the poles and it recedes from the coastal shallow areas and so this is where most of those species lived was in these shallower waters. And so as that water receded and was trapped in the poles, there was a significant amount of habitat loss. And so a lot of those uh, species and families uh, went extinct. So that's our very first mass extinction event at the end of the Ordovician. Um, so we will move on to, this is kind of a fun locality if you know, fossils from Morocco. You've probably seen some of this stuff. This is a very prolific area. And this is uh, what it looks like in the field and what it looks like after it comes out. I'm gonna let Isa talk about it. Here. Those are the Devonian Orthoceras and Ammonites. They come from the area of Erfud. And Erfud is the main fossil hub. It's very close to like Cretaceous area, Fishing, Devonian, Cambrian. In the half an hour drive, you can get to every different area. So lots of researchers and uh, scientists will go there and hang out, just do daily drives and go every day to a different location. And that's where the fossil business started. That's where they found like the first, uh, where they started polishing those little orthoceras plates and ammonites. And uh, that got the interest into like searching for everything else. It started in the 60s and the 70s. Yeah, and another, um very prolific site that's very close to our food is the, the crinoid site. And these are amazing, amazing creatures that, um, and there are crinoids alive today in the oceans. They're mostly, you know, smaller bottom. Uh, they're either attached or kind of floating on the bottom. 
Um, but these ones were as large as nine meters. Yeah, they did it. Bro. So nine meters uh, from the little float. So it had a float that was probably the size of a grapefruit. Um, that then had this kind of spindly stalk that would go down to this head. And crinoids are um, actually animals. They're called sea lilies, popularly, um, but they are not a plant. They're an animal. They're a filter feeder. And you can see these fine little kind of uh, hairs off of their tentacles, and they would filter the water. And any of those particulates, they would bring back into the calyx or their mouth um, in the center. And they would float in colonies that were just massive, massive colonies. And uh, they would actually be creating these little ecosystems of their own because they would be these kind of floating masses that little goniatites and orthoceras could hide in. Um, and so then when a big storm would come or something would happen that would kind of hit these areas, they would all die in mass. And so you find in um, what, near Air Food? Yeah, about 12 kilometers from Air Food. There's these just- there's The layers where they just lay and goes on and on, miles and miles, you can pick up huge slabs of crown lines. Yeah, and so they're broken up in, in chunks. Yeah, make it easier to get out of the ground. And then reassembled afterwards. So, um, yeah. So also in the Devonian, we have um, crazy diversity of trilobites. Um, and so I included this one in this presentation. This is not in the exhibit. We have this display case with, um, with this guy, uh, a cyclopygy and um, several others that you can see under magnification in the actual exhibit hall. But I threw this one into the slide just because there was a paper that was just released like a couple weeks ago about this specific trilobite. This is called a conoprusia. And it's got these little, um, it's a spine on spine conoprusia. And it's just absolutely fascinating and just feathered um, spines, super detailed and intricate. And this was prepared in the yeah. lab, um, in the lab in our food. So really interesting things uh, coming out. But also in the Devonian, in the middle Devonian, we have these giant fish. Um, this is a, a placoderm. Uh, it's a dumpelosteus. And so we'll talk a little bit about the placoderms that kind of arose to dominance in the oceans in the middle Devonian. And they actually died out before the end of the Devonian. Um, but you have this guy, dumpelosteus. He's very famous for his big bony teeth, but they're not teeth. They're just fangs that are bones um, as part of the um, kind of the exoskeleton skull. And you can see these lines that come through. These are all um, uh, nerve channels so that it could feel the water pressure around it. And um, it was an extreme hunter in the middle Devonian. This is the top of the food chain. Um, he was, you know, 40 feet long or 30 feet long. Um, and just yeah, uh, really crazy. They have one of the strongest bite forces is another little tidbit, fun fact about them. Um, but even bigger in the ocean is this guy who is called the Titanictes, and he is a filter feeder. They were filter feeders. And so think basking shark or um, uh, whale shark is kind of the ecological niche that these um, these creatures inhabited. And this is really early for, you know, um, things like this to get so large, you know, I mean, these are definitely far and away the largest things in the ocean at the time. So we get to the end of the Devonian and our second mass extinction event. So again, this one is um, global cooling and a decrease in um, oxygen. And um, we pretty much lose the trilobites. I mean, there's one species or one uh, family that makes it through the extinction event and carries on to the end of the Permian, but pretty much it's the end of these, these wild, crazy, you know, um, protocephalus and, and uh, uh, Sertarg Sertargus. Sertargus. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> there's a lot of species of them, so it's hard to remember them all. Um, 
But yeah, so that's the, the second major mass extinction event. And then um, we come into the Permian. Now, this is an interesting time in Morocco um, because the Permian is uh, a time when the tectonic plates have come together and the uplift in, uh, in between the plate for North America and for Africa has created these mountains that are higher than the Himalayas are today. They are, um, it's not a good place for fossilization, if you know how that occurs. I mean, it's, there's not a lot of, of life living at the top of these mountains. And um, so the, the fossil record in Morocco goes pretty much quiet for the Permian and um, into some of the Triassic. It's, it's pretty quiet there. Um, but one thing that uh, Julius and I discussed, the artist Julius Chutney and I discussed, was um, the fact that uh, trilobites had gone, this particular type of trilobite had gone extinct long before this time period. And so it is quite plausible <laughs> that there would have been trilobite fossils to be found at the top of these mountains. And so we included a fossil just for just for fun, um, to show that this is what was Morocco at one point. And then he also included this kind of green haze, which is another um, hypothetical uh, discussion that we have. We, we talked to several paleontologists about it as well, but this is what uh, Julius was thinking the atmosphere may have looked like at the end of the Permian uh, with the excess methane and uh, CO2 and in the, in the air from all of the, uh, the, the extinction event was pretty much caused by the Siberian uh, traps uh, that uh, just put off massive, massive amounts of greenhouse gases and um, raised the temperature of the earth um, over a, an amount of time. And that amount of time is debatable, but it's, uh, or still under debate, but yeah, so, interesting time in the grander world, but not uh, significant in the fossil record of Morocco, I guess. So then we have um, the Triassic, which I included because we now have the tectonic plates are spreading apart. We have um, some freshwater environments coming back into Morocco. And so we see these massive amphibians. And so this is a metoposaur, and it's um, they find a lot of them in certain locations in Morocco, all piled on top of each other, kind of like how in today in Africa when there are droughts, a lot of the uh, crocodiles and different animals will gather in smaller and smaller and smaller pools until those pools eventually dry up, and the animals are then basically encased in wherever they found so they they find them in very high concentrations in, in small areas but yeah it's more like areas of scattering yeah um so this is a metoposaur skull and um then at the end of the triassic so you can see on this on this chart of biodiversity they're just starting to recover from the mass permian extinction this huge drop and it's just starting to recover and then they're hit again um the world is hit again with um, again, global warming, you have these kind of widespread volcanic events, not a massive one locality, but it's probably more likely from the plates uh, spreading apart and uh, creating some more volcanic activity. So at this point, the mountain range is coming apart and we are going to end up with the Appalachian Mountains and the High Atlas Mountains in Morocco. So we move on to the Cretaceous, and this is really the fun part where things get uh, big teeth <laughs> and everybody loves big teeth. So there's two localities in the Cretaceous that we'll talk about from Morocco. Um, the oldest is Kem Kem, which is uh, where we find Spinosaurus. That's about 95 million years. And then we'll move forward to Karubga, which is uh, 66 million years old. So right at the end of the Cretaceous. Um, so, First, we will talk about uh, Kem Kem, which has been called the most dangerous place on earth. And uh, 
the reason that they call it that is because um, when you look at the different um, species that you can find there, there is a, a theropod the size of a T-Rex. You have crocodiles um, and crocodilomorphs the size of school buses. You have fish the size of cars. You have pterosaurs, raptors, um, and you have this giant, could have been up to 40 foot long. It's a fish eater, Spinosaurus. Um, so it moved into the water. So you actually have an aquatic swimming dinosaur um, that could be up to 40 feet long. <laughs> um, and there's relatively not as many um, prey animals. And so it's just the highest concentration of predators of any place ever on earth at any time period. So it's pretty extraordinary. Um, this area was a river delta. And so it's kind of this alluvial plain that would um, flood and wash any uh, dead bone or dead animals down and, and deposit them all together in this big jumble. So it's really, really rare to find any sort of associative skeleton. You find you know, lots of teeth, tons and tons of teeth, um, some random bones, parts, pieces, bits, you know. Yeah, Teeth. Yeah, um, but there was a discovery. Um, so Spinosaurus, I'll go back into Spinosaurus's history a little bit here. So Spinosaurus, this specimen was originally discovered in Egypt um, and was taken back to Germany. And uh, then World War II happened. And the museum that it was uh, housed in in Germany was actually bombed. And so the specimen was lost. And so for a long time, all that they knew of Spinosaurus was from photographs and from the research that had been able to be conducted on it prior to the war. Um, so we move forward a little bit and they did know that it was a fish eater. Um, they did know that it had this grand sail on its back, but they didn't really know a whole lot more about it. More had been found in Kemkem, so they knew that it was found across the Sahara, um, but it wasn't actually until uh, 2020. Um, well, there was um, a little bit in 2018 where they found these legs. So they, in 2018, they found these legs. So here's the, the new look of Spinosaurus. It goes from that big lumbering theropod um, down to a more of a streamlined swimming aquatic look where you have these legs that go in um, to this massive body and they're more like kind of like paddles or, or more of like a swimming or maybe um, helping themselves move across the uh, river bottom. The front arms are not necessarily strong enough to carry a lot of weight for a long time so probably more aquatic but they still were not sure about that until in 2020, when uh, Paul Serino and Nazar Ibrahim and the Nat Geo team, is that right? Yeah, they just they discovered this tail, and the tail was complete. It was running back into the hill, and so they found each one of these spines, the spindly, delicate spines, all together and all in one piece with this whole tail. It was in the same location where they thought were. Like 15 years ago or something. Yeah. So it was really, really extraordinary. So this specimen came out and um, has now been studied. So you can um, read about that in National Geographic. It's a pretty exciting story that dropped last, last summer, I think. Um, but you can see that this tail has, um, it's much taller than a normal theropod tail. When you think of a T-Rex tail, it comes down straight to a point and then but this one is much taller more like a paddle so that it could swim through the water propel itself through the water now the other interesting thing about spinosaurus is what i've shown up here this is not a post-mortem injury this is something that happened in life and then healed um and so and there are also i couldn't get a close-up photo of them but there are also conical shaped teeth marks in some of these uh spines and so that kind of shows us that um, Spinosaurus led a pretty 
tough life. Um, there's only a couple predators with conical teeth that size in the area. You have Sarcosuchus, which is super croc, but probably not fighting Spinosaurus, probably more likely that it's another Spinosaurus, a larger Spinosaurus fighting for territory or mates or what have you um, in the area. It was a brutal life in the chem chem for all of these predators. There's lots of pathologies found on, on bones, but Spinosaurus in particular, we know that it was biting each other and walking away to tell the tale. Um, so we'll move on from Chem Chem, and we are now in Karuga. <laughs> the, the phosphate that's that's where uh, Cretaceous layers and Eocene, Pleistocene, and that's where we found most of the mosasaurs and the elasmosaurs and uh, some of the shark Ontario, the turtles, crocodiles, everything came from there. It's about three different layers, it goes from the youngest to the oldest to the Lake Cretaceous in the bottom. Mm -hmm. And that's where they find the most sores. In the top layers, they mostly find shark teeth and sometimes like bird bones. Also, they found the earliest uh, elephant, like it's a small elephant they found there too. And it's a, it's a phosphate mine. It's an active phosphate mine. So these are, these are the mining operations. And we say that we're feeding the world with fossils because uh, phosphate from this mine primarily goes in fertilizer. And it's one of, I think it is the world's leading producer of yeah, phosphate. It has the largest deposits. So mm -hmm. they, they're exporting a lot to everyone, Africa. And Something like a third of the world's phosphate comes mm -hmm. from Karubga. So um, out of the phosphate, we find all these things, which Isa was just explaining. These all are Isa's work. He and his lab um, prepared and mounted all of these pieces. And then this is a Julius Chutzny's rendition of what it would have looked like um, uh, back in uh, the end of the Cretaceous. And the fascinating thing about this locality is that all of these creatures are all adults around the same same age, there aren't any young. Um, and so it's probably something like today's feeding frenzies around sardine runs or bait balls that uh, happen, you know, on an on a cycle, where a whole bunch of animals all come to one area at one time for a single feeding event. And in this one, um, probably not sardines, probably more likely um, baculites. Yeah. Um, so little squid-like creatures. But for whatever reason, all of these different species were all congregating as adults in this one area at one time. Um, so, yep, massive feeding event. And then this is Isa's department. This is a turtle that he worked on and explained. Yeah, on the left side, that's the turtle. That's the, and the plastic jacket. That's how we find it. Then we put the plastic jacket around it and get it out of the ground and number every piece and start mounting it 3D. And, and you end up with that. Yeah, so it turns <laughs> into that. And in the bottom right side, that's one of the shops. It so shows an example of all the stuff they find. There's like a bunch of mosasaur tails and vertebras and shark vertebras and skulls and jaws, it's just a fun, wherever they dig, they always find stuff. And so the mine is continually operating. And then it's the local um, residents who are able to then collect these things and bring them out. So it's not like, a, it's not what you would think of as necessarily a scientific dig in the, in this area as much because it's, just trying to preserve, because it's almost impurities in the phosphate. So they're just trying to preserve what they can, get it out as quickly as they can before the bulldozer comes through and takes its next pass. And so it's a very rapid process um, to excavate yeah. as much as they can. So you want to add anything else to? No. Okay, so um, yeah, so then at the end of the Cretaceous, we have um, the uh, world is kind of, oops, 
So we have um, the tectonic plates have spread apart. There is now uh, Morocco is over here and the inland sea of the United States is over here. And um, we have a lot of the same species that are found in the chalk of Kansas, um, uh, tylosaurs and, and uh, archelons and a lot of you know, protostegas, some of the big turtles and stuff are also found in Morocco, the exact same species. And so it's really fascinating because they were probably migrating for these feeding events across this, this ocean coming from the inland sea of Kansas or uh, vice versa. Somehow they were living in the same, <clears throat> same localities. Um, and they're not as far apart in the Cretaceous as they were, as they are today with the Atlantic. Um, so it's uh, pretty interesting there. We have, um, <clears throat> as most people are familiar, there was a giant asteroid that hit the earth and sent a bunch of debris up into the air. There's some debate as to whether things were kind of on a decline already and the asteroid is just kind of what finished it off. Um, but a massive extinction event uh, at the end of the Cretaceous, um, all of the large um, land dwelling creatures and many, many ocean species um, were all wiped out at the end. And I think there was a recent study that came out where there was tidal waves that went all the way up into as far north as North Dakota and, and far up the inland sea, they were finding uh, tectites in the gills of, of fish all the way up in the inland United States. So um, massive devastation, uh, volcanoes and uh, rapid global cooling. Um, so yeah, so that sends us into um, a rise in mammals because now all of the major predators have been able to or have been wiped out. And so there are new ecological niches at the top where new species can proliferate and uh, fill those niches. So we have the rise of mammals. Um, we're still going to hang out in Karubga for a second because that's where all of these crocodiles and birds um, and fish and sharks and everything still, still existed in Karubga. Uh, and then uh, we can go south to, in Morocco. So Karub, Karubga is up here, kind of near Rabat, Casablanca. But it's in the middle century. A yeah. few hours drive. Yeah, three hours in Casablanca. Um, and then down here in Dakla, this is where the whales are found and where some of the other um, sharks, Auriculatus, we'll talk about in a minute, um, are found down in, in this area. So we'll talk about the whales. So from land to sea in an evolutionary blink of an eye. So we have um, land creatures, probably the size of a wolf or a dog, went back into the, uh, the water to fill an ecological niche in the water. Um, and they very, very rapidly uh, went from being fully terrestrial to fully aquatic in a few million years, the span of like 10 million years. So this is uh, one species called a papacitis. You have the skull and then you have the legs and you can see the legs um, come up to these very spindly hips that only have an attachment point on one vertebrae, meaning that they would not have really been very strong for walking long distances out of the water. They probably had some support still. Um, and then their, their toes were just incredibly long. So they probably had webbed feet that they could use as paddles um, to move around very well in the water. Um, you start to see the nasal bones you have the nasal openings are going from more like a, um, a hippo, which is their closest living relative, um, more on the front, moving back up the skull until you get up into modern whales where they're all the way back. Um, so as these whales are getting more and more aquatic, you'll notice that the, the nasal openings are moving farther back on the skull. The other interesting thing about these guys is the teeth. Um, us mammals, we live on land. We have two sets of two different types of teeth for different purposes. 
Uh, dogs, cats, they all have different types of teeth where you have sharp pointy ones in the front and flat molar ones in the back, right? Different purposes. These whales have still two sets of teeth, um, the front pointy graspers, and then you have the slicers in the back. And um, these teeth are fascinating. They have these cusps all along them. And I think there's some study saying that potentially these cusps um, got longer and, and uh, eventually ended up as more like strainers and became more of like the baleen whales of today. And then other whales uh, kept the pointy teeth and are more like the killer whales or the sperm whales of today. So it depends on which type of teeth they kept, but whales of today only have one type of teeth. Um, and, but these, this is a basilosaur. It has um, a ball vertebrae in the back. So it absolutely swam using the propulsion of its fluke. It still has these tiny little legs in the back. So these are vestigial limbs. So they still have legs, um, but they are not used for, uh, for propulsion or anything anymore. So, and they will eventually lose them and it'll become only an embryonic stage in whales today. It'll have vestigial limbs in the embryonic fluke, but not in, uh, adult form. And so then I'll let Isa talk about this. <laughs> That's the location. It's, uh, it's about an hour drive from the next big city, from Dakla. And uh, it's right by the coast. And it's a cliff side also. So it's just, you can't really dig so much because so much dirt on top. But there are a few different locations there mm -hmm. with the different ages. Yeah. So we'll move on to sharks. Sharks are um, obviously still alive today. They're definitely threatened in a bunch of ways. So we have um, here, we have a great white shark. Um, and then here is Megalodon, and uh, which a lot of people are familiar with, and a totus obliquus, um, but would also have been a similar size to a totus auriculatus. And the new species name for um, megalodon is actually a totus megalodon. So it is in this um, genealogical lineup um, of sharks with the totus obliquus. So a totus obliquus is found in uh, Karubga again, and it is um, a Eocene shark. And what's interesting about this shark's tooth, this is an totus obliquus shark's tooth, is it is totally um, clean edges. It is not serrated at all. It's got these little cusps on the side. And so then you can see, this is a, a totus auriculatus. This one fed on whales and things like that. And um, so you can see that it has serrations on the side of its teeth, but it still has these little cusps. Um, and then you move on to a totus megalodon. So this is the, the lineage here. A totus megalodon, also found in Morocco. It has serrated sides um, all around the whole thing and no cusps any longer. And this one fed on whales for sure. So auriculatus um, was feeding on whales and in the basilosaurs and things like that. And then a totus megalodon was feeding on some early baleen whales and things like that. So um and got huge. <laughs> so um, with that, we have our modern day. And in the modern day, we have um, a bunch of things that are going on in our environment. We have lots of species that are threatened today. We have um, uh, some documented global warming, uh, rise in CO2, things of that sort. But I don't want to leave anything on bad note. So I just leave it as question marks and I let people decide for themselves. We do this thing for our next generation in the exhibit, we give them a passport so they can go along and stamp their uh, passport like this at all the different extinction events that happen. And then at the end, we have the same and then they can take this little book home with them. And hopefully this little cutie pie will look back on her passport and be able to make some associations and, and look forward into the future. So, which is what paleontology is kind of for, is we learn from our past to help us out in our futures. So, um, 
So thank you all for having us. And I think there might be a little bit of time for questions if anyone has, has any. Well, thank you. That was great. I really, really enjoyed it. And I noticed that uh, our president, Stephen Goolsby, is in the audience. And I wanted, wanted to um, give him a chance to say, say a few words. And then if he has the first question. <laughs> Well, thank you, Susan. Uh, that was very interesting. I have been to Morocco on a geologic field trip uh, when I was taking my PhD at the Colorado School of Mines. Uh, we were concentrating mainly on the uh, outcrops in the high Atlas Mountains along the Sahara Desert, uh, but you couldn't help but uh, see uh, wonderful fossils there. Some of the, the uh, giant ammonites uh, in the uh, carbonate platform faces and in places patch reef on that, those uh, pla platforms with trilobites where it went uh, to lagoonal and, and eventually subaerial. So uh, a wonderful place, Morocco. Uh, what really uh, stood out to me on that trip, and my wife was with me, uh, was that the people of Morocco were so warm and accepting, and we had a wonderful time with the people there. So uh, my uh, uh, question has to do with uh, the locations of uh, uh, these fossil sites. Uh, being a geologist, I would love to go to to some of these locations just to see the fossils. Uh, is there a good map or brochure or publication that you guys can rec uh, yes. recommend that includes the museums that you've talked about and some of the other fossil sites? Um, there's a Morocco book that just released but yeah. it's hard to get that one because it's only available in France. In France. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, English French. it's English and French book, and it's what I use primarily. In, there's all know. the location, the information of all the fossils and everything. We'll, uh, we'll I'll, send you the name. The link yeah, I'll send the link to Susan and maybe she can post it. It's a two part novel. Um, it's, you know, textbook size and it does the um, Paleozoic and then it does um, the, the everything forward from the Paleozoic to today. And it's a fabulous text and you can read it. It's French and English in the same books. So, you know. And the pictures are very nice. The pictures are beautiful. Details. You'll see a few of right. ice in there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Susan will, will send it on when uh, uh, you send it to her. I'd, I'd love to, to look for that book, maybe uh, buy it online. Thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah thank I'll, you. I'll thank see you. if I can find a way to buy it in the United States. Um, and thank you for doing this for us. We sure appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, I'm so pleased to be here. I need to plug my mom just real quick. She used to be a member of the AAPG when she was an environmental engineer um, before I was born. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so thank you so much for having me. She, this was a very proud moment for her. <laughs> Oh, that's Thank wonderful. You. Oh, so we have a few questions. I think um, Ken Wolgamuth has his hand up. Would you like to unmute him? Yeah, would you like me to stop the share or should I leave this up? Should I just leave it up? <laughs> leave it up. Leave it up. <laughs> I'll leave it up. <laughs> anyway, is this the one that's on display over at the Sam Noble Museum now? And, and yes. How long, Until how February. Long run, how long does it run yet? Well, ICE is going to go in a week to take it down, so you better hustle up. <laughs> well, that's what we're going to do. Are you over there, too, or are you somewhere else? I We are currently sitting in Tucson, Arizona. I okay, live in right. uh, Colorado, um, but ISA is going to run over to uh, uh, take down the exhibit on the 15th. I think they're going to, I think the museum is going to close it on the 12th. Yeah, and yeah. So, we're, here, we're scheduling it right now because <laughs> we're in Tucson. Okay, very good. <laughs> That's why yeah. I wanted to watch this. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. And I'll be interested later in getting some of the content because I reach out to the public 
in uh, church environments. So this uh, sequence is fabulous. Thank you. Oh, great. I'm so glad. Just a reminder that we will be recording, we, we're recording it and I'll be posting it. So you'll have access to it. And I'll Thank send you. Um, so um, it, I, it, it's just a, an amazing one. Okay, so we have another question from Suzanne Mills. Thank you, and thanks for this very informative talk. I'm a collections assistant in the invertebrate paleontology section at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History in Pittsburgh, and we definitely have um, specimens from these localities. They were collected in the 1950s when I believe Morocco was part of um, France by a French collector, but it's been pretty hard to track down the localities. Um, so I'm wondering if it would be possible to contact you directly and correspond yeah. for email. Yeah, absolutely. Wonderful. Yeah, he would be able to look at it and tell you maybe even who collected it. Yeah, he's yeah, only yeah. looking at yeah. it. <laughs> so he has the whole collection of the old French. Uh, yeah, that would be fantastic. Um, where can I find your information? Um, I can be found at curator at spexhibitions.com. And uh, Susan, I'm sure, will post all of my contact information, please feel free to reach out yes. with any questions. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'll make the right connections for you. <laughs> I really appreciate that. Yeah. Susan, uh, uh, somebody posted the link to the book on the chat, so you don't have to worry about sending it. I'll send it just in case. Yeah, because okay. the people will be um, maybe not uh, here, but we'll, we'll get the, the recording. Okay. Okay, uh, it was, uh, uh, I've already followed the link. I sure appreciate it there. There's a couple of other nice links in there too. Thanks. That was me and it's 99 pounds. <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> yeah, I carried it around with me for like two years, both volumes. <laughs> no, I was, I was talking about cost. Oh, the <laughs> book is probably yeah, 99 <laughs> Okay, so we've got, some, yeah, we've got some questions in the in the Q&A. So um, first we, we'll start with, um, let's see. Okay, so Stephen Frank says, thanks, amazing fossils are most or all on display now in Oklahoma, yes. Um, why does CO2 increase with global cooling in the ore division in Cretaceous, but at other times it increases with global warming? Um, hmm. I think a question. I am not totally sure about that. Um, it was something that I found in different paleoclimatology uh, things, but I had a really hard time finding a paleoclimatologist to consult on the exhibit. I reached out to a bunch of different places. And so, um, yeah, so I don't know that I can really answer why it goes up in, um, in global cooling as well. I do know that it was a lot of um, uh, study in seashells that were found on both sides of the um, extinction events. And so there might be something in the, in the study of the shells that shows the increase in CO2 and things like that. So um, I could definitely look into it in more depth, <laughs> so. And we will send information about the tours in Morocco as well as I just put a link in the chat and Q&A to the Sam Noble Museum that closes on February 14th. So you have one week <laughs> to get there. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Otherwise so, you can help I <laughs> Yeah. Um, Jim Tucker has a question. Jim, do you want to open your mic and ask it directly or do you want me to read it? Oh, certainly. Um, yeah, the uh, mentioning, uh, and I don't know the pronunciation, particularly the uh, mm -hmm. you mentioned uh, the phosphate deposits where they find, uh, while mining, uh, they find the uh, body fossils. Um, elsewhere around the world, uh, altered uh, high organic source rocks uh, will uh, produce uh, phosphate deposits. Was this originally a, a, you know, a fetid uh, lake 
setting or a, a restricted marine setting um, that then evolved into uh, the phosphate, uh, the phosphorus phosphate deposits. Thanks. Yeah, um, so it was definitely a marine uh, setting. And um, I don't know a whole bunch about, this is why I wish Serge was here with yeah. us today, because he would have that answer in a heartbeat. Yeah, you know um, but I think that the reason just, that it has so much in. phosphate in it is that it was um, a lot of organic material with all of the detritus from these feeding events and from um, the blooms that would, um, like, I think it was the diatom blooms in today's oceans will bring in all of the, the sardines and the small feeding animals, which then bring the larger feeding animals and all that. And those diatom, diatomaceous blooms will then settle down. And that's what creates that richness and creates that phosphate. But I'm, that is not my department. That would have been a question for Serge. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here, so. No, thank you. Um, thank you. Jean-Philippe Blouet has a, has a question. Hello. Um, I, well, it's, it's not really a question, uh, it's, it's, it's rather a comment or a, because I'm standing right next to a mosasaur, as you just mentioned. Uh, yeah. From and so you can see that one is, is uh, mounted in 3D, as you mentioned. You can get them out from the plaster jacket. And then you can, uh, since it's, it's quite brighter, it's kind of easy to, uh, to remove the bones out of the matrix from the phosphate. And then you can mount the, the skull in 3D. So I just wanted to, to show <laughs> you what kind of result you, you can obtain. And it's fun. That is very yeah. fun. That's awesome. And you have some other fossils behind you as well. I see. Well, well, uh, you are in my, uh, we are in my apartment, so I am surrounded <laughs> by this kind of animal. It's, it's yeah, my job, by the way. I am doing this kind of thing for, uh, for a living to, uh, to prep fossils, in, including fossils from Morocco. But you may recognize that I'm French, so I'm mostly working on fossils from Europe. But I just wanted to, uh, to show you this guy and say hello from from a mosasaur that moved from Morocco to France and knows that has a beautiful smile. Yes, <laughs> very much. Well, so Jean Philippe, where are you located right now? Right now, I am in, I am in France now, so it's the okay. end of the afternoon. Yeah. Mm. Wonderful. Um, okay, so we have another question in the Q and A. Um, Anonymous participant asks, can you clarify what you mean by the percentage or number of families lost? Yeah, so that's, um, this graph um, was something that was made uh, by a couple of different scientists. And so the families is just the um, uh, genus species family. So the number of families that, uh, they were able to document prior to an extinction event versus after the extinction event. So uh, like families of trilobites and things like that. So it's just the, the thing, cause it was a little bit confusing cause a lot of the um, extinction events talk about it in like species lost. So you have 70% of all species lost but only 17% of the families were lost. Um, so you had much more of the smaller brackets but some of the like in that one the the dinosaurs were lost but the um the avian dinosaurs survived so um yeah i don't know if that's that helpful that oh, thank you okay so we have um i guess um oh my goodness so many questions i don't know we'll, we'll take a little bit more time i know we're um We'll, we'll go a little bit over if people want to stay. Um, Clinton yep. it has all of the extinction events are annotated on your time sequences occurring a short time before the actual end of the respective time periods. For example, the end of the Devonian. Can you explain that dynamic? I would have thought the extinction would mark the end of the period. Well, a lot of times extinction events run out um, for a long time period. Like it's the end of the Devonian, I believe was like 10 million years. And there were several kind of mini extinction events throughout like the placoderms went extinct 
in the middle Devonian. So you have extinction events all the way along the geologic time scale. And actually Mosasaurs, um, which are found in the Cretaceous, were so um, prolific a predator that they caused many extinction events of their own. So you can actually document where a Mosasaur would come in and cause extinction events of, of other animals in the area. And so, um, and that's why like in the Cretaceous, again, there was, there is some discussion as to whether it was really the asteroid that was just the proverbial last straw, or if there was, you know, kind of some widespread volcanic activity or some things that were in decline for several million years prior to the actual extinction event. So. And just a reminder, we had a question, will there be a link to recording? Yes, you'll receive one. So. Um, so we have another question. Where in the US is this display being exhibited next? Um, we have a few possibilities, but it's kind of coming back. We um, had it in two lo lo locations and then we wanted to do a little bit of work on it and kind of take some time with it and then put it back out again. So we're actually looking for our next uh, host venue. So. Um, if anyone knows anyone that might be interested, let us know, and uh, we can maybe bring it to your neighborhood. Catherine Schmidt says, I hope this display comes to Pittsburgh. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so, too. I love Pittsburgh. We were just there. <laughs> yeah, maybe we were there Catherine at the National Aviary with another exhibit that we oh, have. Wow. Oh, wow. We were at uh, the National Aviary in Pittsburgh with uh, our Tiny Titans uh, dinosaur egg and baby exhibit. So. Oh, well, wow. I would now, love to be back. <laughs> I would like to say that I um, I was surprised that there's another exhibit that I just really enjoy because it, it again, brought together the paleoecology and despositional environments. That was the Permian monsters. And it was at at the um, Sam Noble Museum about a year ago. And, it, and it, you, you guys organized that and it had a lot of synapses and proto dinosaurs. <laughs> Yep, if you're interested in that one, that one will be opening in Jackson, Mississippi uh, this summer. So uh, I would say the beginning of June, you'd be safe. If you went to Jackson, Mississippi, you could see uh, Permian monsters on display. That's a really great exhibit. Yeah. That, one deals, um, that one deals kind of primarily with the extinction of um, the mass extinction at the end of the Permian that we weren't really able to discuss so much in this this exhibit, so it's a nice overlap there. Yes, it, it really goes into a lot of detail, um, and and it's it's a smaller exhibit. This is massive, but it's really detailed about exactly what was going on in the Permian and the Great Dying, as they say. So, yeah. Um, okay, so let's see if we got everything. Um, Robert Chernock has one more at the end of the Ore Division. How does cooling temperature correlate with an increase in CO2? Today, we think of CO2 as absorbing heat. Thank you. So that's that same, we kind of talked about that before. Oh, yeah, yeah, so was, yeah. <laughs> thing. sorry about that. Yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll investigate that. And, and um, okay, well, I think, does anybody, if anybody has any additional questions, um, raise your hand. And we'll we'll get to it. In the meantime, I'll turn it over to Mike for a few final um, comments. I just wanted to say thank you. Um, it's great to be able to get out of the office and be in the <laughs> office at the same time. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, these types of things we might not think is necessarily um, applicable to Energy Minerals Division and whatnot, but uh, just to kind of pull a full circle. Um, with you guys pulling out, uh, you know, fertilizers, potash, that type of thing, um, it is connected very much so. The paleo climate is directly connected to the energy minerals that we use today. And, you know, we've sort of expanded in our own sense to include things that aren't necessarily energy generators. Um, and that includes fertilizers, things like that. And I mean, it's especially pertinent today when you're talking about what's and I'm going to tie some things in here that is kind of a leap, but you know what what's going on in Ukraine 
and what's going on with global food supplies, global population, potash, and that kind of stuff. So um, personally, I kind of tie that back to some of the work that you guys are doing. I mean, it's a double, it's a double, uh, I don't know what you'd call it. It's a, a double result. You get two results mm -hmm. from it, right? Um, and, the, and the fact that the, um, the Chinese right now are exploring methods of um, harvesting the seafloor for critical minerals. So mm -hmm. when you think about these types of things, it's important to take into consideration what what's going on today um, in terms of preservation and what we can do as global citizens to make sure that we don't make mistakes that are prohibitive um, for future generations. And I guess, you know, I don't want to get too deep in the weeds, but thank you so <laughs> much. It's great to be well, able to see this and uh, I'll talk to you guys later. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, so it's a it's a great tie-in. You know, I think it's awesome because so many of the really prolific fossil sites and fossil discoveries come from mining and exploration and um, things of that sort. So I mean, it's it's quite often that you know geological exploration for minerals of various different things turns up some of the most important scientific discoveries. So they go hand in hand, absolutely. So, so um, Steve, would you like to say a few, Steve Nolsby, our president, would you like to say a few final things? <laughs> well, you're muted, Steve. There you uh, go. Thanks. I, this is wonderful. I'm um, looking forward to, to seeing uh, this. I don't know if you've done this in Denver. Uh, your display and everything, but uh, thank you so much for, for presenting this. We love to have uh, this kind of thing for our, our members and anybody else that uh, uh, logs on with us. So thank you so much. I sure appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, we're very happy to be here. This was, this was great fun. And apparently the slideshow was uh, good for a little teaching tool for some people. I'm, Happy to hear that. So thank you. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I was, I'm so thrilled. And I just want to tell everyone that that Alana, um, Alana was so responsive. So I, I just emailed thinking, well, maybe, maybe there's a possibility. And within like a week and a week and a half, we, we got this together. So I just want to thank you. And and I just I, this is what made me so excited about being a geologist and my when I was first becoming a geologist. So I just like, it just, I feel so reinvigorated. <laughs> so thank you. And just a reminder to everyone, we will send an email that contains contact information about the Moroccan tours, the book, and also um, um, to, to Alana. And, and so we'll have information about that and a link to the recording. And I just want to say thank you too for um, um, our uh, visitors from, from Carnegie and France and stuff like this. So it, it, it's so wonderful to see everybody coming together. And we had visitors from as far away as Azerbaijan and, and, and um, Europe and Asia. And so great. So thanks again. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. And thank you, thank Susan. You, Susan. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you.